County Right to Life chapter. I'd like to welcome you here this afternoon for our Life Rally 2011. It's a great day, a great day to be alive, and a great day to celebrate life. Um, there, just one piece of information. Uh, if you have these little pieces that, of paper that were in your program, if you could uh, have that, take it out, fill it out, and put it in the offering plate at the end of uh, our uh, service today, that would be great. It will help us uh, to stay in contact with you in a lot faster uh, fashion, but also it'll cost, uh, cut our costs in having to do mailings, if we could do it via email. That would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, what I'd like to do is have Pastor Steve Peterson from Zion Covenant Church come up and offer prayer. And at that point, we will uh, do a little bit of shuffling today. Um, these are turbulent times politically, as all of you are aware. Um, and we have some uh, political representatives that may be here. We're not sure. Um, but we're, uh, we're praying for the, all of them for their safety as well. Um, and right now, Pastor Peterson for our prayer. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh God, we come to you this afternoon remembering that you are our creator, the one who knit us together in our mother's womb. We are wonderfully and fearfully made, and we thank you for the gift of life. All of life is in your hands, Lord, from the moment of fertilization until the moment we breathe our last on this earth. Lord Jesus, you chose to enter our world through the loving body of your mother Mary, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Give us the firm belief and conviction to uphold the rights of the preborn as they rely on the mercy and protection of those who know and love you. Holy Spirit, you are the promised spirit of truth, constantly revealing the splendor of truth to your people and leading us deeper into the truths of Scripture. Come to us today and deepen in our minds and hearts the truth about life, its greatness, its dignity, its reflection of the eternal God. Make us appreciate evermore the truth that life is always a gift and that every life is of equal dignity despite all the different characteristics people have or the different circumstances under which they come to be. So come to us, O oh Lord. Free all your people from the falsehoods that lead to the evil of abortion. Free them from the false and harmful ideas which make a God out of their own choices or which fail to recognize the right of life for children in the womb. In your mercy, Convert our elected leaders, judges, and legislatures into the way of life. Come to us gathered here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and as you immerse us in your truth and your love, so make us effective witnesses of that truth within our families, among our friends, in our state and nation, in all the world. Bless every presenter here today. Bless us as we hear their story of your grace in giving them life. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'd like to have the following people come on up for a presentation on the Right to Life Bolathon. Um, first of all, I'd like to have uh, Marley Harmling and Sam White and also Bethany Berg. Also, Alyssa and Ben, come on up. Uh, first of all, I want to just address uh, Bethany. 
Uh, Bethany Berg is a junior at Lutheran High. And um, she has taken over the uh, directing of the uh, Right to Life Bolathon at Lutheran High from her sister Mary, uh, who took it on for a year or two. Um, last year, in 2009, her sister led an effort that uh, was $1,000 that were, uh, ra was raised for the Right to Life Bolathon. And this year, um, Bethany took over and did it again. And, and in honor of that, uh, I presented to the student body um, at Lutheran High School a, an award that we call a Grand Effort for Life. It did not win uh, the, the most money raised because the homeschoolers did it again, but we wanted to recognize Lutheran High and Bethany for her efforts, and hopefully we'll do that again next year. Please join me and congratulate her. Okay, now the group in front of me here, uh, these guys are pretty amazing too. Um, this will be the third year in a row. And uh, this is the Cup of Life Championship Trophy. Uh, we've had it for five years now and for the third year in a row, uh, the homeschool group has come through. Uh, this year they raised just over $2,000. Um, and of our total was just over four, which was a record. So $4,000 raised this year uh, for the Right to Life Bolathon, and these guys were so instrumental in raising over two of that. Let's give them a great round of applause. I'm not aware that we have uh, any legislators here at this point, so we're going to continue with our program. And uh, Jim, if you could let me know, that would be great. Tracy White um, had an abortion early in her life. Um, and instead of having it devastate her for the rest of her life, she has chosen through God's power and God's grace to make it um, her effort and her mission in life to make sure that young women um, who ha have either had an abortion or those who are considering it, that she works with them and tells them exactly what's happened to her. Um, it's been an amazing mission, and uh, right now she is going to be coming up. In advance of her coming up to make a presentation, there is going to be a short skit uh, that is called An American Tragedy. July 23rd, Pet Peeves.
could go for, for a big, nice cheeseburger and deep fried onion rings and a nice, thick chocolate milkshake. Did somebody say chocolate? I thought you needed your beauty sleep. A person needs <gasps> priorities. Well, you might as well go back to sleep anyways. Mom seems to be pretty quiet. I, I'm never gonna sleep on Saturdays. I'm gonna be outside playing with Cinnamon. Who's Cinnamon? My dog, a golden retriever. My dog? Yeah, every boy has a puppy when he's five. Oh, Cinnamon will be my best friend. Well, except for Dad, of course. A puppy? You're lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, what do you want? It's a secret. Come on, you can tell me. I, I won't tell anyone. There's nobody here but us. See, I can't tell anyone. Now come on, please. Okay. Okay. I want a pony. A pony? Wow. That's so exciting. Wait, wait. Do you think Mama and Dad will let you get one? Well, sure. I don't think so. They're they're big and, and they're hairy. I guess one pony won't hurt. <laughs> see, I can see myself now, galloping through the meadow, the sun is shining, the wind in my hair, boom, 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 boom. Do you know what that is? No, what? It's a baby boom. Monday, August 1st, sharing dreams. It's really hot in here. Did you turn off the heat? No, I don't even know how. I tell you, it's really getting hot in here. Hey, hey, feel over here. Ouch, I that's know. hot. But, but it's not hot here, feel. August 11th, Lifelong Friends. Oh. <laughs> 
the best taste of pickle I ever hoid. <laughs> Monday, August 15th. Today, they were aborted. A few years ago, I went through the book, Do Hard Things, with my high school Sunday school class. In this book, Alex and Brett Harris challenged teens to join the revolution. They combined the words rebellion and revolution to form a new word, revolution, which they define as teenage rebellion against low expectations. This book challenges teens to break the mold of how society sees them. They are challenged on every page to do hard things. After introducing the book, I passed out a note card to every student, and I asked them to write down one hard thing that they would like to do. Speak at high schools. Those were the words I wrote on my card. At that time, I really had no intention of ever sharing with the kids what that meant, nor did I know what kind of an impact that book would have on my own life. After reading the last page, I closed the book and I told them the story of another girl. I told them my story. I told 12 <laughs> loudmouth teenagers what I had written on my card a few weeks ago. I told them how this book had not only changed their lives, but it had changed mine too, and I was ready to do my hard thing. Today, I want to share with you my story, a story that began with me as a teenager, a story that I first shared with teenagers, and a story I share that thousands of teenagers can someday hear. I have four scenarios I would like to share with you, and you ask yourself in any of the, these situations if you would consider abortion. The first, a girl is only 19, and she's found out she's pregnant. She has her whole life ahead of her. She feels that she can't talk to, talk to her parents. Second, the father and mother <clears throat> both have TB. They have four children. The first and second are deaf. The third also has TB and she's pregnant again. If she had another child, would this child also be sick? Should she consider an abortion? The third, a white man raped a 13-year-old black girl and she got pregnant. If you were her parents, what would you have her do? The fourth, a teenage girl is pregnant. She's not married. Her fiance is not the father. What should she do? Let's go back to the first scenario and I'll come to the others later. The girl is 19 and found out she's pregnant. That girl was me. 21 years ago, I had an abortion. I was brought up in a Christian home, and I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior at a very young age. It was evident through most of my school years that I loved Jesus. I was very involved and very active in high school. I was on the honor roll. I was a student council member, a cheerleader, a member of the band and the choir, a state runner in track, and I was very active in our church youth group. I graduated from high school in 1989. 
It was in 1990 when I became pregnant. I told myself there is no way this could be happening to me. First of all, I'm a Christian. What are my parents going to say? What is everybody I know going to think of me? I didn't tell my parents I was afraid, I was ashamed. I kept my pregnancy a very well-hidden secret. I was then posed with the question, are you going to keep it? Keep it. I hadn't honestly thought about what I was really going to do. Was I going to place the baby up for an adoption? Or was I going to have an abortion? Abortion was a very tough word for me to swallow. I didn't know much about it. All I knew is that to me, it seemed like the safest and the easiest decision because nobody would ever have to know I was pregnant. Problem solved. I talked to a doctor at Planned Parenthood who assured me that the child I was carrying was a mass and that it wouldn't feel anything. They told me it would be safe to abort the child before week 12. I was at week 11. I made the appointment. I numbly walked into the abortion clinic and I was sent to a counselor who explained to me that this child I was carrying couldn't feel any pain. The reality is, at 10 weeks, a baby can feel comfort and they can feel pain. I was told that it was a blob or a tissue mass. The reality is, at 12 weeks, a baby is fully formed. They can suck their thumb, they can smile, they can make a fist. I was told I would feel little, little or no pain at all. I wasn't informed that abortions could cause death due to hemorrhaging and other complications. I wasn't informed that abortions could cause breast cancer or cervical cancer. I wasn't informed that they could ever prevent you from carrying a child again. I wasn't informed that not only would I experience pain, but that my baby would too. Today, partial birth abortions are being performed on babies, on babies that have been in the womb for five months, being performed on babies up until their full term of nine months. The baby will go through a live delivery up to his or her head. The delivery is then stopped. The head is punctured, which drains all the fluid from the brain, so this makes for an easier delivery. I lay on the table and I was put into what they call the twilight sleep. I was told that I would hear noises, but I shouldn't feel any pain. The procedure was very short. I remember hearing a suction noise like a vacuum cleaner. And then I heard that vacuum cleaner sucking up pieces of something. I didn't know what I was hearing. They never explained this procedure to me in detail. There was no doctor communication, patient communication at all. And then I saw it. I saw what I did. How could they let girls see their babies like that? I saw the remains of my baby. That day, something took over in my brain, something that protected me from that horrific sight. I lied to myself. I buried the memory. The memory of seeing parts of my baby in a container, a cylinder, right at the end of my bed in broad daylight. It wouldn't be until 19 years later that I remembered what horrific sight I had seen that day. The recovery was painful. At the time, it was more physical pain for me than emotional pain. I hadn't told my parents. I hadn't told anybody. I remember lying on my apartment floor bleeding for days. I was in so much pain that my roommate stayed with me there on that floor. Um, I, to this day, I don't think I have experienced a pain that I felt that day. I was scared to go to a doctor, and the clinic said that they didn't want to see me anymore. Um, I wasn't their problem anymore, is what they told me. The consequences of my abortion were not only physical, but they were also emotional. I can't tell you how hard it is for me and how sick and guilty and ashamed I would feel when I would hear people say that it disgusted them that somebody could do that to a baby, or how pathetic does one have to be to have an abortion? There was one day I will never forget. I was driving down the main street of the town I grew up in, and I saw sign after sign being held by pro-lifers. It was signs of dismembered babies, signs of babies still healthy in their mother's wombs, signs of babies that looked like little jigsaw puzzles that needed to be put back together. And that day, I realized I took a life. I didn't take a tissue mask, but I took a life. In this country, we declare one is alive or dead by the activity in their brain or the beating of their heart. 18 days from conception, that little heart starts beating. Five weeks after conception, the brain is active. There is life in the womb. People who commit heinous crimes are given food and water and comforts in this life until it's their time to pay for their crime. 
What is it that these unborn living babies have done to deserve a death sentence? According to our medical community, if your heart is beating and your brain is active, you're alive. Follow me back to my story. I have a part that is very hard for me to say. It's special, though, to me. Um, I was adopted also when I was four days old. I was given the chance by a woman who knew for whatever reason that she could not raise me. I don't know her circumstances. Maybe she financially couldn't afford me. Maybe there were people swaying her decision. I don't know her reasons. All I know is she chose to give me life. She carried me for nine full months. She chose to give me to a couple that she didn't even know. I'll never know how hard that day was for her, but I have to thank her for giving me life. I attended a 40 Days for Life with my daughter, who was eight at the time. We wore signs that day. The one I wore on my shoulders um, are words that I will never forget. It said, adoption, the loving option. That day was special to me in a bittersweet way. Being a woman who was adopted, being a woman who had aborted, and being a woman able to walk with that sign on my shoulders with my daughter. Excuse me. Two years ago, I was doing some research on the internet. And I came across a video, and it was by far the most horrific piece of video I have ever seen to this day. It was a video of a baby who was being aborted. That night, I realized babies feel pain. I saw with my own eyes babies trying to squirm and get away from prodding and poking and suctioning. I saw babies being murdered. And these were babies that looked like babies. They were fully formed. I remember going into our bathroom. I locked the door. I turned on the fan, I turned on the water, any noise I could make, and I curled up in the corner of our bathroom. I don't think to this day I've ever cried that hard. Um, I was in hysterics. My response scared me so much that I had to call my husband, who couldn't understand me on the phone. I literally felt at that moment I was losing my mind. I found myself cradling my arms as though I was rocking a baby, and then I realized something. I was rocking my baby. You see, Years earlier, I realized I had taken a life. And throughout my healing process, I never really addressed the feelings that I had repressed, feelings that, of grief that I didn't even know existed inside of me. That night, 19 years after my abortion, I allowed myself to mourn the loss of my child. And I experienced a feeling of peace, a feeling of peace that only my Heavenly Father can give me through His forgiveness. In the fight for life, sometimes women who have had abortions feel trampled on. Knowing we made a huge mistake, we hide in secrecy and shame. We don't look at ourselves as murderers who just ended the life of a baby. Most look at it as just terminating a pregnancy. I've been around many pro-life men and women whose intentions are anything but hurtful, but at times seem a little insensitive. In the fight for the unborn, it seems that the mother's feelings don't matter or are forgotten about. That is anything but the truth. If you're sitting here today and you've had an abortion, can I please tell you that you have value? For you, there's forgiveness and there's healing. There is redemption. There's peace and freedom. God's grace is so sufficient to deal with bad memories, wounds, and failures from the most scarred pasts. One in four women experience abortions. The woman sitting next to you could be a statistic. Your friend may be a statistic. The woman who sat next to you in church this morning might be one of those statistics. The real truth is, though, that our church is not just filled with statistics, but women like me who have had abortions. Churches, what can we do to help and encourage these women? Women who hide their abortions because they're afraid they're going to be judged. Women who hide their abortions because Christians shouldn't have a sin that big. Or women who don't want to expose their past because it's just too painful. How sad to know that these women hear of God's love and forgiveness, but they've never felt it. If you've had an abortion, talk to somebody, please. Feel free to talk to me. I have cards with my information. You need to heal and find forgiveness. Can I tell you that his forgiveness will set the captive free, and you are that captive? Maybe someone here is pregnant or knows of somebody who is and doesn't know what to do. 
there are alternatives to abortion. Please don't let anyone ever tell you that abortion is the best option. Maybe you're pregnant and the doctors have told you that if you have this baby, it will have health issues or birth defects, and you feel you cannot handle a baby with medical problems. Can I tell you I personally know of a family who just recently adopted a little baby boy with Down syndrome. They chose that baby. Can I tell you of a family I know who has a daughter with Down syndrome? Just today, every Sunday, I'm so blessed by hearing her sing behind me in church, and she brings such a smile to my face to come up and have back scratches or to say good morning to me. Can I tell you of a family who knew that their, or who was told their child was going to have Down syndrome, and when he was born, he was perfect. He didn't have Down syndrome. If they would have chosen abortion, they would have taken the life of a healthy baby. Because why? Because a doctor advised them that this was an option for them? Who are we to play God? It is our God who creates life. And who are we to end something so precious, even if in our own eyes it might not be perfect? Guys, you may be sitting there wondering, what does this have to do with me? Well, I can guarantee you that in this crowd, there will be one of you in this room or somebody that you know who will be put in a situation someday, a situation that I guarantee will not have an easy ending, a situation that because of your actions, you will have to reap the consequences, a situation that will put you in the place of making a decision that will affect your life, the life of your girlfriend, and the life of an unborn child. What would you decide or encourage her to do? Would you push her into something she'll regret for the rest of her life so you will just get off easy? Girls, my story isn't a rare one. I guarantee also that this is going to happen to you or someone you know. Don't sit there and say, that's never going to happen to me because I tell you what, I was that girl. I sat in that chair and said, no way. If you're on the pill, which was my case, please don't think that that is safe sex. The only safe sex is abstinence. Check your relationships, girls. Does he respect you when you say no? Are you doing it because if you don't, he won't like you? Trust me, if that's the case, he's just not worth it. A few moments of great sex can turn your life into a nightmare of pain, regret, guilt, denial, and depression. But the sad part is, the truth of it, it won't be a nightmare. It'll be your reality. Let's go back to the four scenarios that I began with. The second case of the father and a mother with TB and who already have four very sick children. What did you decide? Would you have chosen to end the life of Beethoven? In the third case of a white man who raped a 13-year-old black girl, you would have killed Ethel Waters, the great black gospel singer. If you would have said yes to the fourth case of a teenage pregnant girl whose fiancé is not the father, you would have just declared the murder of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Wow. It's hard to continue after that, but we are going to continue. Um, it has been a, uh, a very difficult uh, time in our state politically for the last few weeks. And um, I think possibly today, for at least for the next hour, uh, it's a great break for a number of our state representatives and state senators who have made their way here to get away from the uh, budget repair bill. and. Uh, and have an opportunity for us to recognize them and applaud them for the tremendous job that they do every day in Madison on behalf of life. So uh, I don't know if the lights could come up a little bit, but we'd certainly like to recognize uh, some of the, uh, the folks who are here, and that would be State Representatives Dan Lemahue, Steve Castell, Mike Ensley, and State Senators Joel Lipham and Glenn Grothman.
And if Senator Gr Glenn Grothman could come up and give us a legislative update, uh, try to keep it under, uh, you know, under four or five minutes, that'd be great. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, well, I I'm glad to be here. Uh, and we're, we're at what? Was it the 25th or what rally is this? Are we number 25, number 26? Do we have a number? 26 rally. Okay, which is pretty sad. Because um, we shouldn't be on the 26 rally, should we? Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll touch on a couple things here. Uh, first of all, I guess is a legislative update. So one more time, we have a legislative agenda in Madison. Uh, the, the first thing we're going to deal with in Madison, or the most important thing, is we have a budget coming up. And people have not picked through the most significant thing in that budget so far. When, when they get done picking through with it, it'll begin to make the paper. And that is, to the degree possible, they can't do it entirely, but to the degree possible, we're going to try to defund Planned Parenthood in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> Um, people got to know what Planned Parenthood stands for. We're in the middle of a moral and spiritual breakdown in this country. And it didn't just happen. The primary engine fueling that moral and spiritual breakdown, I am convinced, is Planned Parenthood. That organization was found, actually when the organization was founded up until the 60s, the founder of that organization didn't even like abortion. Do you know that? Because it was so barbaric. Abortion would have been considered so barbaric in this country 50 years ago that Margaret Sanger herself has quotes out there saying that she wouldn't be for abortion. Because as evil as that woman was, and that organization was founded to promote promiscuity among the youth, that organization was founded to stop procreation among people who she considered her racial inferiors. That, pro that organization was founded to stop having children because she didn't like children. But even she, in the early 60s, was against abortion because even if somebody as evil as her couldn't, get her couldn't get her mind around the idea that cutting apart a little baby was bad. But nevertheless, as that, as that organization expands their touch, they are destroying America. So that's the first neat thing we're going to do in Madison, and we are going to do that. The, the second thing is, of course, the... I guess what I'll call the anti-Christian atheist extremists, they want to get a hold of the young. And one way they get a hold of the young is, of course, through Planned Parenthood and their money, but the other way they get a hold of them is through the schools. And a year ago at this time, one of their goals was to pass a sex ed bill that basically the proponents would say uh, required taking away the innocence of the kids down to the middle school, required, I would say, promoting a non-judgmental, which is to say a favorable view of the world of, of, of homosexuality, which wasn't even talked about 50 years ago, uh, and, and basically corrupting the youth. We want to repeal that bill this time around. Uh, <laughs> The third thing is, you know, under this Obamacare, uh, uh, they're going to wind up funding abortion. We want to opt Wisconsin out of that. We're going to opt Wisconsin out of that. Yeah. And, and finally, our goal is to strengthen the laws regulating abortion in, in the state of Wisconsin so that we knock down that 7,000 figure. Uh, which is good too. You can applause for that. <laughs> but I always feel the biggest problem we have is not in Madison and not in Washington. It's the hearts and minds of the people and that the churches are not doing a good enough job. And I was reminded of that one more time this year. Now there's a bill up that's received a lot of publicity that has nothing to do with this crowd. And that is that budget repair bill. Okay, it's been in the paper, blah, 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 blah. And I don't even like dealing with it because there are a lot of good Christians on the other side of the issue, and I don't like being on the wrong side of any good Christians. That being said, on that bill, there was one day in which 52 clergymen marched through that Capitol supporting that bill, which shows that it's not impossible for a clergyman to find the state Capitol. 
Last year, when we had that, what they call Healthy Sex Act or Healthy Youth Sex Act or whatever it is, it was like pulling teeth to get two clergymen to the Capitol to say that it's wrong to push a bill with, what else can I call it, graphic sex ed for sixth graders. Okay, now there's something wrong with the clergy of this state. You know, um, one gal once said, when's abortion going to end? It's going to end when the church says it's going to end. The churches are not saying it's going to end right now. Okay, because right now the churches consider this issue too controversial or something to really dial it up and do something about it. So what I'm going to ask you to do, and I guess the reason they have me talk here is to encourage people like Joe and Steve, Mike and Dan, uh, to vote for these bills, and we'll vote for these bills. Sheboygan County is a great county. What I'm going to ask you to do, in addition to showing support for your pro-life legislators and tell them how to vote, is tell your clergyman to get off his rear end, you know, ask your denomination to say it's time to start talking about the Bible and time to start talking about living a Christian lifestyle because our country is going down the tubes unless we get God back on our side. So thanks for having me. You know, I saw him on Fox News this week, and man, he's better live than on TV. <laughs> uh, we're going to take an offering right now to keep Sheboygan County Right to Life financially viable. Uh, it's been a great year, and thanks to many of you who write checks during the course of the year, uh, support people who are involved in the Bolathon, go to the, uh, the rummage sale, do all those types of things. That's great. Um, if you can uh, give a little bit more today, that'd be wonderful. While this is going on, while the, um, that you guys can start the offering if you'd like, we are going to have uh, an introduction to 40 Days of Life by Sarah Galke. If you want to come on up, that'd be great. Um, please, uh, if you can, uh, we're not going to have any music during the offering. If you can keep the, your uh, talk down, we'd like to have Sarah come on up and, and introduce us to 40 Days of Life. Let's give her a warm welcome. Hello. I am, I'd like to thank you first for giving me a few minutes of your time to speak about 40 Days for Life. This semester, my friends and I have been studying the book, How Shall We Then Live? It is um, by Francis Schaeffer. His book speaks about the worldviews of people all through the centuries, ending with where we are today and how we, as Christians, have to act on what we believe to impact the culture for God. These two things really inspired my friends and I to speak out against an issue that we are all very passionate about, abortion. That was when my mom suggested that we should host a 40 Days for Life in Sheboygan for the first time. 40 Days for Life is a national movement that started on March 9 and will be going through April 17. People are standing outside of abortion clinics and Planned Parenthood facilities, holding signs, speaking out against abortions. We all decided to take on this project and make a difference. Every day for 40 days, we are trying to get people to sign up and stand in front of the Planned Parenthood building on Kohler Memorial Drive in Sheboygan. We are looking for people to fill two-hour time slots during those days, and anyone can sign up for whatever day or days that they would like to help out with. Even though it already started, we still need more volunteers. Last Wednesday was the first day, and it went really well. Twenty-two people showed up to kick off this project, and we spent time praying and holding signs. We received a lot of good responses from people driving by. God has really worked in this movement in the past. Through 40 Days for Life alone, it has been recorded that 3,599 lives have been spared from abortion. And those are just the ones that we know of. 43 abortion clinic workers have quit their jobs and walked away from the abortion industry. Nine abortion facilities completely shut down following a 40 Days for Life campaign. In Madison, there were plans to start performing late-term abortions. But because of people who continually held signs that spoke the truth of abortion, others working to stop the plans, and a merciful God, they decided not to click, carry on with those plans. We can see now that God has blessed this movement, and we want to make a difference here in Sheboygan. This is a peaceful vigil, and we want to bring hope to a hopeless place. 
We will be holding signs and praying, and if the opportunity arises, sharing with those passing by. If you would like to help out, we have a table set up in the foyer for anyone who has more questions or would like to sign up. We can use all the help we can get. We know that the Lord will bless and use what goes on through this campaign, and we are expecting great things. Thank you. He's a pro-life attorney and author. Um, you may have read a little bit of information about her on the flyers and the posters that were around town. Um, she wrote a book called Conceived in a Rape, A Story of Hope. And I think that uh, in, in listening to, uh, to Tracy and her story uh, of, of hope and redemption, uh, that Rebecca has a very, very unique and incredible story um, that we are going to be a uh, witness to in just a moment. She's been um, a guest on the 700 Club. She's been on uh, CNN, CBS, and just a variety of other um, national networks. Uh, she's also a mother of five, a homeschooler, um, and a uh, pretty amazing woman. Uh, please uh, give a warm welcome for Rebecca Kiesling. earlier. Well, I'm very glad to be here. I was adopted nearly from birth, and like many adoptees, for years I dreamed of being able to meet my birth mother. My search began on my 18th birthday, and I was shocked to have been told on that day that that door was closed, that I would never have the opportunity to meet her, and that was very difficult for me. All these years, I just had this expectation. It was my information. So at 18, I went ahead and I petitioned for what's called my non-identifying information. And when it arrived, it had everything you can imagine about my birth mother except for her name. It had her eye color, hair color, height, weight, age, the age of my half-brother and half-sister who were 11 and 13 when I was born, her ethnicity, religious background, occupation, educational level, detailed medical history. And I just hung on to every word. But then for my father, it said that he was Caucasian and of large build. And that was it. And I thought, that sounds like a police description. I mean, come on, she couldn't even say his eye color, hair color, nothing. And I thought it over. I mean, what could the possible explanation be? And I called up my caseworker and I asked her, was my mom raped? And she said, yeah, I didn't want to tell you. And I was just devastated. I remember feeling so ugly and so unwanted and thinking, who would ever love me? Who's ever going to want to marry me and have a family with me? Because the explanation for my adoptive brother growing up who had been in and out of jail and prison from the age of 16 was that socially deviant behavior is genetic. Well now what does that mean about me, about who I am? Do I have this ugliness lurking inside of me? If I would give birth to a son someday, would he become a rapist? And I really believe that a nice guy wouldn't want to get involved with someone like me. And then, of course, at the same time, I thought about the issue of abortion, because that's what you always hear about, right? Growing up, abortion wasn't talked about a whole lot in my family. When I was 12, my 16-year-old cousin had one, and I recall the discussions being that this was not a good thing. In high school, I remember studying this issue and seeing photos of aborted babies and being horrified. But I didn't identify with that. I didn't think, oh, that could have been me. No, I thought it was just some sad story where she couldn't afford to keep me, but abortion doesn't apply to my life. I thought, and I turn 18, I get this information, and it has to do with my very existence. And it was as if I could hear the echoes of all those people who would say, well, except in cases of rape, hmm? Or, uh, especially in cases of rape. And now all those people were talking about me, 
about my life. And I felt like I had at least half the world against me. That there's all these people out there who don't even know me who are standing in judgment of my life, so quick to dismiss it just because of how I was conceived. And I felt like I was now going to have to justify my own existence, that I would have to prove myself to the world that I shouldn't have been aborted and that I was worthy of living. And after a while, I had it all worked out in my head that if I could just meet the certain societal standard that's out there that dictates what one's value is, if I could just make myself attractive and successful, and if I could just find that relationship where someone would love me, then I could have value and I could feel good about myself and I figured people could then look at me and say, oh well, look at Rebecca, this nice, young, attractive, intelligent woman. Clearly, Rebecca shouldn't have been aborted. And then everyone would just see the light and single-handedly, I could bring an end to abortion in this world. <laughs> and thank God I am not the savior of this world and I couldn't even save myself. But isn't that message so prevalent in our society that your value is based upon perhaps how you were conceived, how smart, what you do with your life, how much money you make? Motivational speakers will tell you that if you could just make something out of yourself, then you too could be somebody. Well, you know, not everybody has those opportunities or capabilities and people mess up in life. And so what then? They're not somebody or they're nobody, where some people would tell you that your value is based upon the sum total of your successes versus your failures, and if your successes in life outweigh your failures, well then, you're a person of value, and you have something to offer this world. But if your failures outweigh your successes, if you've just messed up too many times in your life, or if your burdens outweigh your benefits, then in the ledger sheet of life, you're a liability. And you're either not worth as much as everybody else, or you're disposable. And I guess I had really bought into that lie. And I wanted to have all of my assets lined up so people could look at me and see me as being a person of value at a time in my life when I felt like I was being devalued every day. And isn't that why so many young women choose abortion? Because they think that somehow their life is not going to be worth as much if they have this child out of wedlock, that that would be seen as a failure, or they wouldn't be as marketable for marriage in the future, or they think that they couldn't get their college degree in just the right amount of time. And they want to stay in the rat race and be a person of value, and they buy into abortion as being their solution. I understand what it's like to feel that way. I settled in relationships like I should be thankful that somebody would want to be with somebody like me, jumped into relationships that became more and more controlling and abusive until ultimately I was beat up by a boyfriend from law school. He broke my jaw. My front tooth was hanging. I had to have all kinds of surgery to have it put back in, root canal, more surgery to try to save it. I was told I could still end up losing my front tooth someday. And after 13 years, I had to have it pulled, which, again, was devastating. But I was speaking at a banquet in Alabama, and an expert in cosmetic dentistry came up to me afterwards and offered to do all of my teeth for free. And not just three with a bridge and four to match, but eight teeth with porcelain veneers. So... <laughs> And I share that story with you because it's another example in my life where there was something that happened that was really, really awful. But then something beautiful came out of it. And isn't that what God is famous for? The worst evil that man has in store, God can take and use it for good, for his glory. It's the story of Joseph in Egypt what man meant for evil, God can use for good, and it's the story of our Savior. And the story doesn't have to end with the violence having victory. Now, I am very thankful for this nice new set of teeth, but let me make one thing clear. That does not make me pro-domestic violence. Just like being thankful for my life does not make me pro-rape. But people actually say that to me, especially on university campuses during Q&A. They'll say, oh, so what you're saying is that if abortion had been legal, you wouldn't be here today. Well, you know, 
if your birth mother hadn't been raped, you wouldn't be here today either. So does that mean that you're pro-rape? They actually say that to me. And I explain to them that there is a huge moral difference because I did exist. And my life would have been ended because I would have been killed through this brutal abortion. I may not look the same as I did when I was four years old or four days old, yet unborn in my mother's womb, but that was still undeniably me, and I would have been killed. That is a huge moral difference. Now, at the time I'd been beat up, I had really hit rock bottom. From all outward appearances, I had so much going for me. I excelled in academics and athletics. I was attending a great law school. But I was totally deteriorating on the inside over this whole issue of value. And that is when God called me back to him. The first time I'd ever heard the message of the gospel, I was 15. Up to that point, I'd had lots of friends who invited me to church over the years with them, but no one ever shared their faith with me. I had been adopted and raised in a very secular Jewish household. God was utterly irrelevant in our house. I never saw my parents pray, although I was bat mitzvah and everything. And trust me, Jesus is not a popular subject in a Jewish household. <laughs> and I was amazed, and I believe that night. But... After nine months, I no longer had a ride. I felt forsaken by my church friends. And I ended up spending some of those toughest years of my life away from God, away from church, on my own doing things my way and the world's way until he called me back. And it's been amazing what he's done in my life since then. But let me take you back to when I was 18 and I first learned how I was conceived. Of course, at that point, I thought about my birth mother. And I thought... She must hate me. This has absolutely got to be the worst thing that's ever happened to her in her life. She's never going to want to meet me. She probably wanted to abort me. And then again, after a while, I had it all figured out that if somehow I could just meet her and if I could hear that maybe there was some mistake, that this was not how I was conceived, then again, I could feel good about myself and I could feel safe. Like, I wouldn't have to still feel like I was a target. I didn't want to be part of that classification conceived in rape. You know, who would? So I ended up being one of the first people in Michigan to allow my caseworker to try to contact my birth mother and see if she wanted to meet me. And it worked. I was attending college out of state at the time. I finally received a letter with my birth name, which was Judy and Miracle, so I was a miracle baby. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. And it had her name, Joanne, with her phone number, trembling, I called. She said she was sorry to hear that I already knew. But then she proceeded to fill me in on some horrific details that I was totally unequipped to hear. She's 4'10", she weighed 90 pounds, really petite. A single mom heading to the grocery store at night right down the street from her home, the guy jumped out of the bushes with a knife, abducted her, and basically she went on to describe for me in graphic detail how he brutally raped her. And that's how I was conceived. That was so hard to hear for several reasons. First of all, to think that I was conceived out of a truly worst case scenario. I just felt totally worthless, like garbage. Because of people who would say that my life was like garbage, that I was disposable. Then I had to realize that my biological father was a really bad man. She had gone to several police lineups and stopped going because she wouldn't recognize his face, but they knew that this was a serial rapist. And then all these years, I had really dreamed so much of meeting her. I had written poetry about meeting her. And so to hear that she had been violated like this really pained me. We arranged for me to fly home and meet her on her 51st birth date. And in the meantime, she sent me photos and a letter. And she wrote, My dearest Rebecca, hoping by now that the shock of finding out all the details of your birth are 
forgotten. For that was not reason enough of having to give up something as beautiful as you were. Nothing as precious as a baby. Mostly when you carry one nine months and you go through the birth all alone, feeling like no one loves you. But you were so perfect and pretty. All these years, I had nothing of you, nothing saying you were part of me. Just the memory of carrying a baby that I hoped one day would try to find her real mother as I always wanted to know my baby. You were always with me in my thoughts. You were always with me in my heart, mostly in July. It seems like a lifetime, I know. When I was sick two years ago, I thought I would never get to know my little girl. Would you please even get me a copy of the letter you sent to the Oakland County judge? It made me cry. Also, I would like copies of your poems. These are things I would like to read. It's been a long three weeks looking forward to our meeting. I didn't know how to express my inner feelings. And then she put in caps. It's so great, big, beautiful. It's always been my dream. I am so happy I'm crying. And then she wrote in closing, a love that ate at me for 19 years. My daughter at last, with love, your mom, Joanne. Well, that was just all my dreams come true. I felt so affirmed and I felt like, yes, I was wanted. I flew home, had a wonderful reunion weekend with her. The next day, she had a huge family reunion for me. I got to meet my half-brother, which was really weird to think we could have grown up together. Six years later, I flew down to Florida for a five-generation photo, got to meet my half-sister. It was the fourth time in a row that they had five generations of women alive. I got to room with my grandmother at the time, which was so cool. But after this initial reunion weekend, I flew back to college, went to a few meetings of Students for Life. I didn't get involved at that point because I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. But it gave me the courage and support I felt I needed to finally call her and ask her about abortion. Because I still needed to know. And she told me that if abortion had been legal in Michigan at the time, that she would have aborted me. I said, you don't mean if you had to do it all over again, right? And she said, no. And I said, well, what about everything you said in that letter? And she said to me, you don't know what it was like. And I know that that's true. But I also know that today, she's OK. In fact, she's doing great. She has a wonderful husband, a beautiful home. And despite the utter horror of her saying that to me, I still chose to nurture a relationship with her, to honor her for the role that she did play in my life. And frankly, I just thought that if I was good enough, that she'd change her mind. Well, by the time she did change her mind, I was at a really good place in my life where I no longer needed to hear that for my own well-being, but it was still great to hear. I was with her when she was making baby clothes for my niece in Florida, who was in a crisis pregnancy with her first great-grandchild. She said to me, you know, I'm really glad that she decided to have this baby, and I've changed my mind about all that. Two days later, Norma McCorvey. Jane Roe from Roe v. Wade announced the very same thing to the nation, that she had changed her mind about abortion after years of having worked in an abortion clinic, yet never actually having had one herself. And how nice that she could do that, change her mind about abortion, and still have the opportunity to enjoy a relationship with her daughter from that case. People forget she had a daughter who was targeted for abortion in that case. Not some fictitious, theoretical, philosophical, legal entity called a fetus, but a real person. Don't ever let people forget that we're talking about real people, especially in the case of Roe versus Wade. Her daughter's around my age. The trial date in Texas was held exactly 10 months from my birth date. The U.S. Supreme Court decision was exactly three and a half years to my birth date. So I just barely made it. And so did her daughter. This issue would come up quite a bit in law schools, you can imagine. 
I'd share a little with my classmates as to how I was conceived and explain to them the truth that whenever you identify yourself as being pro-choice or whenever you make that exception for rape, that what that really translates into, and this includes, let me just add, supporting exceptions for rape, legislators, <laughs> because supporting an exception equals allowing for exceptions equals making exceptions. It's all the same. Or when you say that uh, you're for abortion, especially in cases of rape, what that really translates into is you being able to stand before me, look me in the eyes, and say to me, I think that your mother should have been able to abort you which is a pretty powerful statement. And I would never say anything like that to someone. I would never say to someone, if I had my way, you'd be dead right now. But that is the reality with which I live. It's like, describe for me how it's not. It's not like people say, oh, I'm pro-choice except for that little window of opportunity in 1968-69 so that you, Rebecca, could have been born. No, this is the reality of it, and I can tell you that it hurts and it's mean. But I know that people don't put a face to this issue. For most, it's just a concept, a quick cliche. They sweep under the rug and forget about it. And I do hope that my story and the multitude of other stories on my website of people conceived in rape or who became pregnant by rape can help to put faces, voices, stories to this issue. In response, I'd have people say, well, I'm not saying that I think that your mother should have aborted you. I'm just saying I think it should have been her choice. Yeah, but her choice was to abort me. You don't really know that. Well, no, I do know that. How can you really know something like that? Because she told me. Well, maybe she might not have. But she said she would have. And it's like, wait a second, this thing you say you believe in, why all of a sudden now standing here before me, are you so uncomfortable with the truth that you now have to create this fiction in your mind that maybe she might not have in order to try to absolve yourself of any sense of responsibility? The fact is that I am alive today because of pro-life advocates and pro-life legislators in Michigan who, without even knowing of my exact existence, yet recognized that mine was a life worth saving. And they made sure that abortion was illegal in Michigan, even in cases of rape. 100% pro-life, no exceptions, no compromise. They are my heroes, and I owe my life to them. And that is why I, in turn, do the same for others. You know, when they talk about how much they care about women, well, I'm a woman, and they could care less about me. What good is my right to anything if I don't have my right to life? And then I'd have people just try to blow me off with, oh, well, you were lucky. And I explain that this has nothing to do with luck. This has to do with decisions that were made, choices that we all make every day, whether we get involved, how we vote, and don't tell me that our brothers and sisters who are being aborted every day are somehow unlucky. What a cop out. My birth mother went to two back alley abortionists and I was almost aborted. For the first, she said, it was the typical back alley conditions that you hear about as to why she should have been able to safely and legally abort me. She said there was blood and dirt on the floor and on the tables. And those back alley conditions and the fact that it was illegal caused her to back out as it did with most women. And then she got hooked up with a more expensive abortionist, once again through the rape counselor that the police had referred her to. She said there were no pregnancy resource centers back then, but if there had been, she would have gone. And this time, she was to meet someone in Detroit at night. Someone would approach her, say her name, blindfold her, put her in the back seat of a car, then take her and abort me, then blindfold her again and drop her back off. And you know what I think is just so pathetic is that I know that there are an awful lot of people out there who would hear me describe those conditions and their response would just be, oh, like, it's just so. 
awful that your birth mother should have had to have gone through that in order to have been able to abort you. <laughs> like, that's compassionate? Because understand that they think that they're being compassionate. But that's pretty cold-hearted from where I stand, don't you think? Because that is my life that they're so callously talking about. She's okay, life went on for her, but I would have been killed through this brutal abortion. Well, the night that she was to have me aborted, she was prepared to go through with it. My aunt was to drive her, and she spoke with this abortion doctor on the phone, expressed concern for her safety, he told her she was being stupid. She said, okay, you're gonna call me names? All right, just forget it. Well, then he went on to swear at her profusely, and she finally just hung up the phone on him. He called her back the next day to try to once again talk her into allowing him to take my life. And the same kind of conversation took place. I can't even tell you what it feels like to know that somebody wanted to take my life so badly that he would even call back the next day. You know, for some people, their near-death experience is waking up out of a coma to find out that they were almost killed in an automobile accident. For me, this is my near-death experience. And the fact that I was younger doesn't make it any less real or any less significant. I wasn't lucky, I was protected. Legality matters. Then people would say, oh, and let me just add, you know, I'm so thankful that my life was spared. But a lot of well-meaning Christians would say things like, oh, well, you know, God really meant for you to be here. But I know that God intends for every unborn child to be given that same opportunity. And it's not like I can stand up here and say, oh, well, look what I've done with my life. I deserved it. At least my life was spared. I can't do that. Can you? Can you just sit there and say, oh, well, at least I was conceived out of two loving parents? At least I was wanted, at least I'm alive, or just pff, whatever. And then you hear people say things like, well, don't you think it's a bit extreme to force a rape victim to have to carry the rapist baby? Okay, first of all, I am not the rapist baby. As in most instances, the rapist doesn't even know of my existence. And what an insult to the majority of rape victims who not only choose life, but the majority of them choose to raise that child. After everything they've been through, you're actually going to say that that's the rapist baby? And secondly, I think it's a bit extreme to tell another living human being that they're garbage, that they don't deserve to be living, that they weren't worthy of protection. I think that's a bit extreme, don't you? We need to point out who the extremists really are. And then people would say, well, oh well, if you had been aborted, you wouldn't be here today and you wouldn't know the difference anyway, so what does it matter? And believe it or not, some of the top abortion philosophers use that same kind of argument that the fetus never knows what hits them, so there's no such fetus to miss their lives. Like, I guess, as long as you stab someone in the back while they're sleeping, well, then it's okay because they don't know what hits them. And I'd explain how their same logic would justify me killing you today because oh, you wouldn't be here tomorrow and you wouldn't know the difference anyway, so what does it matter? And they just stand there with their jaws dropped like, gee, it's amazing what even just a little bit of logic can do when you really think this thing through and what we're really talking about, that there are lives who are not here today because they were aborted. It's like the old saying, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a noise? Well, yeah. And if a baby is aborted and no one else is around to know about it, does it matter? 
And the answer is, yeah, their lives matter. My life matters. Your lives matter. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. The world is a different place because it was illegal for my birth mother to abort me back then. Your lives are different because she could not legally abort me because you're sitting here listening to me today. But you know, you don't have to have an impact on audiences for your life to matter. And there is something that we are all missing here today because of the generations now who have been aborted and it matters. I was frustrated with people who'd say things like, well, I don't believe in God, I believe in the Bible, so like, I'm pro-choice. So I wrote a 43-page essay, The Right of the Unborn Child Not to be Unjustly Killed, The Philosophy of Rights Approach. I took all the top abortion philosophers, followed their arguments, showed the clear air in their logic. It's a very sound document. Love to challenge anybody to it. It's on my website. And um, you can Google pro-life speaker and my website um, will be the first to come up. So it's easy to find me. You don't have to remember how to spell my last name. And, um, or Google conceived in rape or pregnant by rape or philosophical abortion essay. It's easy to find. And I thought, wow, you know, it'd be so cool to handle one of these kinds of cases, but I figured you'd never be able to unless you work for the Attorney General's office or the ACLU, and I wouldn't be caught dead working for the ACLU. I had a professor in law school who was so proud that he had helped legalize abortion in Kentucky, one of the first states, and I knew his family growing up, and I knew that he'd adopted his daughter shortly before Roe v. Wade. So I went up to him after class and should have done it during class so everybody could see what a big jerk this guy was. I said to him, but Professor Sedler, what if your daughter had been aborted? And he just looked at me point blank without hesitation and said, well, we would have adopted someone else. How would you like to have him for a dad? You're disposable. You're replaceable. Like, it's just all about him as long as he gets to have a kid. Kind of ignores the fact that it's not so easy to adopt since there's been legalized abortion. For a long time, nationwide, the statistic was that only 4% choose adoption in crisis pregnancies. I just saw the latest statistic last month. It's down to 1% now. Kind of gives you an idea of what kind of a person would help fight to legalize abortion. Again, pretty cold-hearted, I think, especially when that's your own child that you're talking about. But the truth is that whenever you have a parent who says they're pro-choice, it's really the same thing. Well, I think that if I had wanted to, I should have been able to. I mean, after all, it is my body. But no need for you to worry. I wanted you. You were convenient for me at the time. You understand, don't you? How messed up is that? Like your parent is the gatekeeper of your life and you get attitudes like, I brought you into this world and I can take you out too. And it's not like people really get that real with their children and have those kinds of conversations, but that is the reality of it. And you wonder why so many young people today don't feel valued. Well, that experience in my life with domestic violence gave me a heart for families in crisis, so I am doing what I would said I would never do, which is become a family law attorney. And I was able to help people in my law practice every day when they had hit rock bottom, and I had women coming in who were pregnant and being told all kinds of things that they could force an abortion, force an adoption, block an adoption. They'll kick her out, they'll get custody, and the most common one is that this abortion money is the last dime you'll ever get from me. Post-abortion support groups are filled with women who say that they were told that very same thing and that they felt like they had no other choice. Women go into pregnancy centers and they typically say things like, I just can't have this baby right now. They know it's a baby. They don't sit there and say, I just can't have this fetus right now. They know it's a baby, but again, they feel like they have no other choice. And I don't think it's being much of a feminist to sit there and say, you're right, you can't. You couldn't possibly have the strength of character it takes to see this thing through. You can't. Oh, and I'm not going to help you. And they take their abortion money, because it's an industry, and they're nowhere to be found when they're dealing with the awful aftermath. 
And I find it so ironic that these so-called feminists are basically the first to argue that women are pretty much weak and pathetic and can't handle very much. Oh, how can you expect a woman to have to carry a baby? You know, like a baby is the scary monster and the enemy. You know, whatever happened to I am woman, hear me roar. And now a woman has to be afraid of a baby? And so I educate and empower women like a true feminist and like pregnancy centers do and telling them, you are stronger than you think. You can have this baby, and we will help you. I had numerous photos of babies and the tear-jerking thank you letters that God used me in my law practice to save from abortion. I represented them for free, whatever their needs were, if it meant sparing the life of that child. I began doing workshops for pregnancy centers on an abortion-minded client's life-giving legal options. And I thought, this is so cool. I never knew by becoming a family law attorney I'd get to do this kind of work. It was totally the desires of my heart from when I was in law school. And then I had four cases that were national, international news, one of the kind cases in the country and the world, two involved rape and abortion. One was the frozen embryo case in Michigan. And these cases came to me not from any pro-life organization, but from my yellow page ad under family law attorney, because that's what they needed. They didn't even know I was pro-life when they called me, let alone the rest of it. And I just know, as it says in scripture, that God had a plan for my life from the time that I was conceived. And I know that this was part of it. God sent me a godly man of character who honored me throughout our courtship despite the horrible mistakes of the past. My birth mother was included in the, in the wedding invitation as one of the parents, and she was walked down the aisle in our wedding as one of the mothers. If you ask her today, <laughs> if, you, if you ask her today, she will say that I am a blessing to her. And I think about how different our society would be if everybody understood that truth that we see throughout Scripture, that every child is a gift, a blessing, a reward. Then when they'd hear a situation like mine, instead of saying, oh, how awful. You mean to tell me that woman was raped and she was actually forced to carry that child? Instead, they could say, wow, how good is God? You mean to tell me he rewarded her with the gift of that child's life to bring her hope and healing for the future? All the major research done shows that to be the truth. The ones who give birth express that there was something very healing of having something beautiful come out of something really awful, that it helped them to overcome the rape. But the ones who had the abortion expressed that it was far more difficult to overcome the abortion than it was the rape, that it was yet another violent intrusion into the womb after already being traumatized. They're four times more likely to die within the next year after the abortion because they have a higher murder rate. The abortion often helps perpetuate an abusive relationship. They have a higher rate of suicide, drug overdose, domestic violence, divorce, depression throughout their lives, and on and on. So it is not even compassion for the rape victim. We know with incest that it is always the perpetrator who is protected with the abortion. Not only does the rape typically end for her when she gives birth, but also for all the other young women in the household who are being raped. But people just assume that they would be better off without ever having done the research. If you really care about a rape victim, you would want to protect her from the abortion and not the baby. A baby is not the worst thing that could ever happen to a rape victim. An abortion is. One of uh, my husband and I went on to adopt not second best last resort, but God's first choice and meant for the body of Christ. Um, our two boys have the same birth mother. They would have been easy targets for abortion. They have um, powerful stories of their own. Our, then we adopted another child too. Actually, our second adopted child, Cassie, to everyone's surprise, was born with a very serious genetic disorder. She spent 12 days in children's hospital and 21 days in her home. In researching this, all I could find was how to detect in utero so that you could have the opportunity to abort, and most of those babies are aborted. 
And I think it's so awful and tragic that people would look at Cassie and say that she wasn't as good or that it wasn't worth going through that. Let me tell you, it was an honor to take care of her. And I definitely had the sense that it was one of the most important things that I'd ever done in my life. Then we went on to experience infertility. Didn't know we would, but four years, there, I knew that there was no way I was going to a doctor who does IVF in vitro. I learned from the frozen embryo case, they have their clients check off choosing to destroy embryos, choosing abortion, selective reduction therapy, they call it, even before a single child's been created. Total premeditated murder. And there was no way I was going to go to one of them. And then I found out there's such things as pro-life fertility doctors who do way more testing to find out what actually is going on. And they have better success rates, and they don't exploit people's ignorance and desperation to become pregnant. And we got pregnant the very first month, and now we have three biological daughters. And they are all our second generation abortion survivors. My birth mother's grandma, Joanne, to our children. I won't get into why this was necessary, except to say that um, my adoptive father had basically forsaken me and my family, and um, there were some ugly situations. And in order to protect my children, Four months ago, 22 years from the day we met on her birthday, my birth mother and her husband legally adopted me. And I am very pro-adoption, you know, having a couple adopted children myself. But for me, this was my fairy tale ending. And in my life, it was God showing him once again showing himself once again to be a father to the fatherless. One of the greatest things that I've learned is that the rapist is not my creator, as some people would have me believe. My value and identity are not established as being a product of rape, but a child of God. There are no words that any person could say to me that could heal me, that could make up for what I've been through and what I learned. But when I read God's word on it, it spoke to the depths of my soul. Though my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will receive me. <gasps> Who else is going to say that to me? Society will receive me? And a father to the fatherless is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. We're told that it is in the spirit of adoption that we're all called to be God's children through Christ. Not second best, last resort, but God's first choice and meant for the body of Christ. And most importantly, I know, and I can teach my children, that if you want to know what your value is, you don't have to prove your worth to anyone. But all you have to do is look to the cross because that is the infinite price that he paid for your lives. He thought I was pretty valuable. And you are too. I hope you know your own worth. When you can say that you are pro-life without exception, it's like saying, I get it. You matter. Yours was a life worth saving. And now I hope you will go forward from here and do the same for others. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Amazing. We wish you Godspeed also in all the other traveling that you do and present this. Some people work behind the scenes for causes that they believe in, and others are right out in front. This year's recipient of the Friend of Life Award has been active in both places. She has held up signs in defense of life outside of abortion clinics. This year's recipient has given testimony in Madison 
and made herself available to men and women who have been adversely affected by abortion. She has taken on the responsibility of the pro-life booth at the Sheboygan County Fair and has helped in putting together this year's rally. She has made it a mission to educate people about the reality of what abortion really does to women. Please join me in welcoming the winner of this year's Friend of Life Award, Dee McCoy. Thanks. Um, speechless. But um, 2005 is when it all started for me here, when in 2003 I started healing for my three abortions and my miscarriage. And I thank you for all your support because I couldn't do it without you. And thank you so much. Uh, we want to wrap it up tonight, or this afternoon, uh, before it gets to tonight. Um, and I, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, first of all, thanks for taking the time to attend. This is an annual event, but uh, we don't want to stay just an annual event. One time you honor life. I know that you guys do it in your own private lives. We need to get more public about this. Um, there is a 40 Days for Life booth outside uh, this room. Uh, if you could uh, stop over there and talk to some of the people who are involved in that, that would be wonderful. Um, you know, stay active, stay vigilant, uh, stay true. Uh, we've heard a lot of references to God and, you know, tr stay true to God's word. He talks about life. It is all throughout the Bible. Um, November 2010 was pretty amazing. Um, for life, it was an incredible election. And now we hold our state representatives and state senators accountable. Uh, not only that, we replaced somebody in Washington. We now have Ron Johnson there, and that was a pretty incredible election. But we have one more to go. We want coal out of Washington, right? Now, one last thing, and that is um, presidential election, I know, is you know, a year and a half, two years away. It's already gearing up. We need to hold conservative candidates accountable for life. They cannot be conservative unless they choose life in the way that they vote. Let's make sure that we're vigilant on that. Um, the balloons up here are for kids. Anybody who wants to come on up can grab one uh, and, uh, and then can uh, head back. You are all invited to stay for refreshments out and back. Thank you so much for coming to this year's Right to Life rally. Thank you.